Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew and today I'll be reading a story for you. I'll be reading Sunbird by Neil Gaiman. If you enjoyed today's reading and would like to watch the next program, Word of Mouth is broadcast on the first and third Thursday of every month at 12.10 p.m. Central. Uh, it's broadcast on the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page. That's at MCCPL Morgan. Or it's uploaded later to the Montgomery City County Public Library's uh, YouTube page. I believe that's all the announcements I have for today. So let's get on with our story. Sunbird by Neil Gaiman. <clears throat> They were a rich and rowdy bunch at the Epicurean Club in those days. They certainly knew how to party. There were five of them. There was Augustus Two Feathers McCoy, big enough for three men, who ate enough for four men, and who drank enough for five. His great-grandfather had founded the Epicurean Club with the proceeds of the Tontine, which he had taken great pains in the traditional manner to ensure that he had collected in full. There was Professor Mandalay, small and twitchy and gray as a ghost, and perhaps he was a ghost, stranger things have happened, who drank nothing but water and who ate dull portions from plates the size of saucers. Still, you do not need the gusto for the gastronomy, and Mandalay always got to the heart of every dish placed in front of him. There's Virginia Boot, the food and restaurant critic, who had once been a great beauty, but was now a grand and magnificent ruin, and who delighted in her ruination. There was Jackie Newhouse, the, decadent, the descendant on the left-handed root of the great lover, gourmand, violinist, and duelist, Giacomo Casanova. Jackie Newhouse had, like his notorious ancestor, both broken his share of hearts and eaten his share of great dishes. And there was Zebediah T. Crawcussel, who was the only one of the Epicureans who was flat-out broke. He shambled in unshaven from the street when they had their meetings, with half a bottle of rot gut in a brown paper bag, hatless and coatless, and too often partially shirtless. But he ate more than any of them. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy was talking. We have seen everything that can be eaten, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy, and there was regret and glancing sorrow in his voice. We have eaten vulture and mole and fruit bat. Mandalay consulted his notebook. Vulture tasted like rotten pheasant. Mold tasted like carrion slug. Fruit bat tasted remarkably like sweet guinea pig. We have eaten cockapoo, eye eye, and giant panda. Oh, that broiled panda steak, sighed Virginia Boot, her mouth watering at the memory. We have eaten several long extinct species, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. We have eaten flash-frozen mammoth and Patagonian giant sloth. If we had but gotten to the mammoth a little faster, sighed Jackie Newhouse. I could tell why the hairy elephants went so fast, though, once people got a taste of them. I am a man of elegant pleasures after only one bite. I found myself thinking only of Kansas City barbecue sauce and what the ribs on those things would be like if they were fresh. Nothing wrong with being on ice for a millennium or two, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. He grinned. His teeth may have been crooked, but they were sharp and strong. Even so, for real taste, you had to go for honest-to-goodness mastodon every time. Mammoth was always what people settled for when they couldn't get mastodon. We've eaten squid and giant squid and humongous squid said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. We've eaten lemmings and Tasmanian tigers. We've eaten bower birds and ortolan and peacock. We've eaten the dolphin fish, which is not the mammal dolphin, and the giant sea turtle and the Sumatran rhino. We've eaten everything there is to eat. Nonsense. There are many hundreds of things we have not yet tasted, said Professor Mandalay. Thousands, perhaps. Think of all the species of beetle there are untasted. Oh, Mandy, sighed Virginia Boot. When you've tasted one beetle, you've tasted them all. And we've all tasted several hundred species. At least the dung beetles had a real kick to them. No, said Jackie Newhouse. That was the dung beetle balls. 
the Beatles themselves were singularly unexceptional. Still, I take your point. We have scaled the heights of gastronomy. We have plunged down into the depths of gustation. We have become cosmonauts exploring undreamed of worlds of delectation and gourmanderie. True, 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 said Augustus to Feathers McCoy. There has been a meeting of the Epicureans every month for over a hundred and fifty years. In my father's time, in my grandfather's time, and my great-grandfather's time. And now I fear that I must hang it up, for there is nothing left that we, or our predecessors in the club, have not eaten. I wish I had been here in the twenties, said Virginia Boot, when they legally had man on the menu. Only after it had been electrocuted, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Half fried already it was, all char and crackling. It left none of us with a taste for long pig, save one who was already that way inclined. And he went out pretty soon after that anyway. Oh, Krusty, why must you pretend that you were there? asked Virginia Boot with a yawn. Anyone can see that you aren't that old. You can't be more than sixty even allowing for the ravages of time in the gutter. Oh, they ravage pretty good, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel, but not as good as you'd imagine. Anyway, there's a host of things we haven't eaten yet. Name one, said Mandalay, his pencil poised precisely above his notebook. Well, there's Suntown Sunbird, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel, and he grinned his crookedy grin at them, with his teeth ragged but sharp. Never heard of it, said Jackie Newhouse. You're making it up. I've heard of it, said Professor Mandalay, but in another context. Besides, it is imaginary. Unicorns are imaginary, said Virginia Boot. But gosh, that unicorn flank tartar was tasty. A little bit horsey, a little bit goatish, and all the better for the capers and the raw quail eggs. There's something about the sunbird in one of the minutes of the Epicurean Club from bygone years, said Augustus to Feathers McCoy. But what it was I can no longer remember. Did they say how it tasted? asked Virginia. I do not believe they did, said Augustus with a frown. I would need to inspect the brown proceedings, of course. Ah, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. That's only in the charred volumes. You'll never find out about it from there. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy scratched his head. He really did have two feathers, which went through the knot of black hair shot with silver at the back of his head. And the feathers had once been golden, although... By now they were looking kind of ordinary and yellow and ragged. He had been given them when he was a boy. Beetles, said Professor Mandalay. I once calculated that if a man such as myself were to eat six different species of beetle each day, it would take him more than twenty years to eat every beetle that has been identified. And over that twenty years, enough new species of beetle might have been discovered to keep him eating for another five years. And in those five years, enough beetles might have been discovered to keep him eating for another two and a half years. And so on. It is a paradox of inexhaustibility. I call it Mendeley's beetle. You would have to enjoy eating beetles, though, he added. Or it would be a very bad thing indeed. Nothing wrong with eating beetles if they're the right kind of beetle, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Right now, I've got a hankering on me for lightning bugs. There's a kick from the glow of a lightning bug that might just be what I need. While the lightning bug or firefly, Votinus paralis, is more of a beetle than it is a glowworm, said Mandalay, it is by no stretch of the imagination edible. They may not be edible, said Crawcussel. But they'll get you into shape for the stuff that is. I think I'll roast me some. Fireflies and habanero peppers. Yum. 
Virginia Boot was an eminently practical woman, she said. Suppose we did want to eat Suntown Sunbird. Where should we start looking for it? Zebediah T. Crawcussel scratched the bristling seventh-day beard that was sprouting on his chin. It never grew longer than that. Seventh-day beards never do. If it was me, he told them, I'd head down to Suntown of a noon in midsummer, and I'd find somewhere comfortable to sit, Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house, for example, and I'd wait for a sunbird to come by. Then I'd catch him in the traditional manner, and cook him in the traditional manner as well. And what would the traditional manner of cooking him be? asked Jackie Newhouse. Why, the same way your famous ancestor poached quails and wood gross, said Crawcussel. There's nothing in Casanova's memoirs about poaching quail, said Jackie Newhouse. Your ancestor was a busy man, said Crawcussel. He couldn't be expected to write everything. But he poached a good quail nonetheless. Dried corn and dried blueberries soaked in whiskey, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. That's how my folks always did it. And that was how Casanova did it, said Crawcussel, although he used barley grains mixed with ravens, and he soaked the raisins in brandy. He taught me himself. Jackie Newhouse ignored this statement. It was easy to ignore much that Zebediah T. Crawcussel said. Instead, Jackie Newhouse asked, And where is Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house in Suntown? Why? Where it always is, third lane after the old market in the Suntown district, just before you reach the old drainage ditch that was once an irrigation canal. And if you find yourself outside one eye Cain's carpet shop, you've gone too far, began Crawcussel. But I see by the expressions of irritation upon your faces that you were expecting a less saint less accurate description. Very well. It is in Suntown, and Suntown is in Cairo, in Egypt, where it always is, or almost always is. And who will pay for an expedition to Suntown? asked Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. And who will be on this expedition? I ask the question, although I already know the answer, and I do not like it. Why, you will pay for it, Augustus, and we will all come, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. You can deduct it from our Epicurean membership dues. And I shall bring my chef's apron and my cooking utensils. Augustus knew that Crawcussel had not paid his Epicurean Club membership in much too long a time, but the Epicurean Club would cover him. Crawcussel had been a member of the Epicureans in Augustus' father's day. He simply said, And when shall we leave? Crawcussel fixed him with a mad old eye and shook his head in disappointment. Why, Augustus, he said, We're going to Sun Town to catch the sunbird. When else should we leave? Sunday, sang Virginia Boot. Darlings will leave on Sunday. There's hope for you yet, young lady, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. We shall leave Sunday indeed. Three Sundays from now, and we shall travel to Egypt. We shall spend several days hunting and trapping the elusive sunbird of Sun Town. And finally, we shall deal with it in a traditional way. Professor Mandalay blinked a small gray blink. But, he said, I am teaching a class on Monday. On Mondays, I teach mythology. On Tuesdays, I teach tap dancing. And on Wednesdays, woodwork. Get a teaching assistant to take your course, Mandalay, oh Mandalay. On Monday, you'll be hunting the sunbird said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. And how many other professors can say that? 
They went one by one to see Crockcustle in order to discuss the journey ahead of them and to announce their misgivings. Zebediah T. Crockcustle was a man of no fixed abode. Still, there were places he could be found if you were of a mind to find him. In the early mornings, he slept in the bus terminal where the benches were comfortable and the transport police were inclined to let him lie. In the heat of the afternoons, he hung in the park by the statues of long-forgotten generals with the dis dipsos and winos and the hop heads, sharing their company and the contents of their bottles and offering his opinion, which was as that of an Epicurean, always considered and always respected, if not always welcomed. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy sought out Crawcustle in the park. He had with him his daughter, Holly Battery No Feathers McCoy. She was small, but she was as sharp as a shark's tooth. You know, said Augustus, there is something very familiar about this. About what? asked Zebediah. All of this, the expedition to Egypt, the sunbird, it seemed to me like I've heard about it before. Crockhustle merely nodded. He was crunching something from a brown paper bag. Augustus said, I went to the bound annals of the Epicurean Club, and I looked it up. There was what I took to be a reference to the sunbird in the index for 40 years ago, but I was unable to learn anything more. And why was that? asked Zebediah T. Crockhustle, swallowing noisily. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy sighed. I found the relevant page in the annals, he said, but it was burned away, and afterward there was some great confusion in the administration of the Epicurean Club. You're eating lightning bugs from a paper bag, said Hollyberry No Feathers McCoy. I seen you doing it. I am indeed a little lady, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Do you remember the days of great confusion, Crawcussel? asked Augustus. I do indeed, said Crockhustle, and I remember you. You were only the age that young Hollyberry is now, but <sighs> there is always confusion, Augustus, and then there is no confusion. It is like the rising and setting of the sun. Jackie Newhouse and Professor Mandalay found Crockhustle that evening behind the train tracks. He was roasting something in a tin can over a small, charcoal fire. "'What is that you're roasting, Crockhustle?' said Jackie Newhouse. "'More charcoal,' said Crockhustle. "'Cleans the blood, purifies the spirit.'" There was basswood and hickory cut up into little chunks at the bottom of the can, all black and smoking. "'And will you actually eat this charcoal, Crockhustle?' asked Professor Mandalay. In response, Crockhustle licked his fingers and picked out a lump of charcoal from the can. It hissed and fizzed in his grip. A fine trick, said Professor Mandalay. That is how fire eaters do it, I believe. Crockhustle popped the charcoal into his mouth and crunched it between his ragged old teeth. It is indeed, he said. It is indeed. Jackie Newhouse cleared his throat. The truth of the matter is, he said, Professor Mandalay and I have some deep misgivings about the journey that lies ahead. Zebediah merely crunched his charcoal. Not hot enough, he said. He took a stick from the fire and nibbled off the orange-hot tip of it. Ah, that's good, he said. It's all an illusion, said Jackie Newhouse. Nothing of the sort, said Zebediah T. Crockhustle, primly. It's prickly elm. I have an extreme misgiving about all this, said Jackie Newhouse. My ancestors and I have a finely tuned sense of personal preservation, one that has often left us shivering on rooftops and hiding in rivers, one step away from the law or from gentlemen with guns and legitimate grievances. And that sense of self-preservation is telling me not to go to Suntown with you. I am an academic, said Professor Mandalay, and thus have no finely developed senses that would be comprehensible to anyone who has not ever needed to grade papers without actually reading the blessed things. Still, I find the whole thing remarkably suspicious. If this sunbird is so tasty, why have I not heard of it? 
You have, Mandy Old Fruit. You have, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. And I am, in addition, an expert on geographical features from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Timbuktu, continued Professor Mandalay. Yet I have never seen a mention in any book of a place called Suntown in Cairo. Seen it mentioned? Why, you've taught it, said, Zeb uh, said Crawcussel. And he doused a lump of smoking charcoal with hot pepper sauce before popping it in his mouth and chomping it down. I don't believe you're really eating that, said Jackie Newhouse. But even being around the trick of it is making me uncomfortable. I think it's time that I was elsewhere. And he left. Perhaps Professor Mandalay left with him. The man was so gray and so ghosty that it was always a toss-up whether he was there or not. Virginia Boot tripped over Zebediah T. Crawcussel while he was resting in her doorway in the small hours of the morning. She was returning from a restaurant she had needed to review. She got out of the taxi, tripped over Crawcussel, and went sprawling. She landed nearby. Wee, oui, she said. That was some trip, wasn't it? Indeed it was, Virginia, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. You would not happen to have such a thing as a box of matches on you, do you? I have a book of matches on me somewhere, she said. And she began to rummage in her purse, which was very large and very brown. Here you are. Zebediah T. Crawcussel was carrying a bottle of purple methylated spirits, which he proceeded to pour into a plastic cup. Meths, said Virginia Boot. Somehow you never struck me as a meth drinker, Zebby. Nor am I, said Crawcussel. Foul stuff. It rots the guts and spoils the taste buds. But I could not find any lighter fluid at this time of night. He lit a match, then dipped it near the surface of the cup of spirits, which began to burn with a flickery light. He ate the match, then he gargled with the flaming liquid and blew a sheet of flame onto the street, incinerating a piece of paper as it flew by. Crusty, said Virginia Boot. That's a good way to get yourself killed. Zebediah T. Crawcussel grinned through black teeth. I don't actually drink it, he told her. I just gargle and breathe it out. You're playing with fire, she warned him. That's how I know I'm alive, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Virginia said, oh, Zeb, I am excited. I am so excited. What do you think the sunbird tastes like? Richer than quail and moister than turkey, fatter than ostrich and lusher than duck, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Once eaten, it's never forgotten going to Egypt, she said. I've never been to Egypt. Then she said, do you have anywhere to stay the night? He coughed a small cough that rattled around in his old chest. I'm getting too old to sleep in doorways and gutters, he said. Still, I have my pride. Well, she said, looking at the man, you could sleep on my sofa. It is not that I am not grateful for the offer, he said, but there is a bench in the bus station that has my name on it. And he pushed himself away from the wall and tottered majestically down the street. There really was a bench in the bus station that had his name on it. He had donated the bench to the bus station back when he was flush, and his name was attached to the back of it, engraved upon a small brass plaque. Zebediah T. Crawcussel was not always poor, Sometimes he was rich, but he had difficulty in holding on to his wealth, and whenever he had become wealthy, he discovered that the world frowned on rich men eating in hobo jungles at the back of the railroad, or consorting with winos in the park, so he would fritter his wealth away as best he could. There was always little bits of it here and there that he had forgotten about, and sometimes he would forget that he did not like being rich, and then he would set out again and seek his fortune and find it. He had needed a shave for a week, and the hairs of his seven-day beard were starting to come through snow white. They left for Egypt on a Sunday, the Epicureans. There were five of them there, and Hollyberry, No Feathers McCoy, waved goodbye to them at the airport. 
It was a very small airport, which still permitted waves goodbye. Goodbye, Father, called Holly Bellary, No Feathers McCoy. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy waved back at her as they walked along the asphalt to the little prop plane, which would begin the first leg of their journey. It seems to me, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy, that I remember, albeit dimly, a day like this long, long ago. I was a small boy in that memory, waving goodbye. I believe it was the last time I saw my father, and I am struck once more with a sudden presentiment of doom. He waved one last time at the small child at the other end of the field, and she waved back at him. You waved just as enthusiastically back then, agreed Zebediah T. Crawcussel, but I think she waves with slightly more aplomb. It was true, she did. They took a small plane and then a larger plane, then a smaller plane, a blimp, a gondola, a train, a hot air balloon, and then a rented jeep. They rattled through Cairo in the jeep. They passed the old market, and they turned off on the third lane that came to. If they had continued on, they would have come to a drainage ditch that was once an irrigation canal. Mustafa Stroheim himself was sitting outside in the street, perched on an elderly wicker chair. All of the tables and chairs were on the side of the street, and it was not a particularly wide street. Welcome, my friends, to Kawa, said Mustafa Stroheim. Kawa is Egyptian for a cafe, or for a coffee house. Would you like tea, or a game of dominoes? We would like to be shown to our rooms, said Jackie Newhouse. Not me, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. I'll sleep on the street. It's warm enough, and that doorstep over there looks mighty comfortable. I'll have coffee, please, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. Of course. Do you have water? said Professor Mandalay. Who said that? said Mustafa Stroheim. Oh, it was you, little gray man. My mistake. When I first saw you, I thought you were someone's shadow. I will have shokar bosta, said Virginia Boot, which is a glass of hot tea with sugar on the side. And I will play backgammon with anyone who wishes to take me on. There's not a soul in Cairo I cannot beat at backgammon if I can remember the rules. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy was shown to his room. Professor Mandalay was shown to his room. Jackie Newhouse was shown to his room. This was not a lengthy procedure. They were all in the same room, after all. There was another room at the back where Virginia would sleep, and a third room for Mustafa Stroheim and his family. What is it that you're writing? asked Jackie Newhouse. It is the procedures, annals, and minutes of the Epicurean Club, said Professor Mandalay. He was writing in a large leather-bound book with a small black pen. I have chronicled our journey here and all of the things that we have eaten on the way. I shall keep writing as we eat the sunbird to record all the tastes and textures, all the smells and the juices. Did Crawcussel say how he was going to cook the sunbird? asked Jackie Newhouse. He did, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. He said that he will drain a beer can so it is only a third full. And then he will add up herbs and spices to the beer can. He will stand the bird up on the can, and with the can in its center cavity, place it on the barbecue to roast. He says it's the traditional way. Jackie knew how sniffed. Sounds suspiciously modern to me. Crawcussel says it is the traditional method of cooking the sunbird, repeated Augustus. Indeed I did, said Crawcussel, coming up the stairs. It was a small building. The stairs weren't that far away, and the walls were not thick ones. The oldest beer in the world is Egyptian beer, and they've been cooking the sunbird with it for over 5,000 years now. But the beer can is a relatively modern invention, said Professor Mandelay, as Zebediah T. Crawcussel came through the door. Crawcussel was holding a cup of Turkish coffee, black as tar, which steamed like a kettle and bubbled like a tar pit. That coffee looks pretty hot, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. Crockhustle knocked back the cup, draining half the contents. Nah, he said, not really. 
And the beer can isn't really that new of an invention. We used to make them out of an amalgam of copper and tin in the old days. Sometimes with a little silver in there, sometimes not. It depended on the smith and, well, what he had at hand. You needed something that would stand up to the heat. I see you're all looking at me doubtfully, gentlemen. Consider, of course, the ancient Egyptians made beer cans, or where else would they have kept their beer? From outside the window at the tables in the street came a wailing in many voices. Virginia Boot had persuaded the locals to start playing backgammon for money, and she was cleaning them out. The woman was a backgammon shark. Out back of Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house, there was a courtyard containing a broken-down old barbecue made of clay bricks and a half-melted metal grating and an old wooden table. Crock Hustle spent the next day rebuilding the barbecue and cleaning it, oiling down the metal grill. That doesn't look like it's been used in forty years, said Virginia Boot. Nobody would play backgammon with her any longer, and her purse bulged with grubby piastres. Something like that, said Crock Hustle. Maybe a little more? Here, Jenny, make yourself useful. I've written a list of things I need from the market. It's mostly herbs and spices and wood chips. You can take one of the children of Mustafa Stroheim to translate for you. My pleasure, Krusty. The other three members of the Epicurean Club were occupying themselves in their own way. Jackie Newhouse was making friends with many of the people of the area, who were attracted by his elegant suits and his skill at playing the violin. Augustus Two Feathers McCoy went for long walks. Professor Mandalay spent time translating the hieroglyphics he had noticed were incised upon the clay bricks in the barbecue. He said that a foolish man might believe that they were pr uh, proven the barbecue in Mustafa Stroheim's backyard was once sacred to the sun. But I, who am an intelligent man, he said, I see immediately what has happened is that the bricks that were once long ago part of a temple have over the millennia been reused. I doubt that these people know the value of what they have here. Ah, they know all right, said Zebediah T. Crockhustle, and these bricks weren't part of any temple. They've been right here for 5,000 years since we built the barbecue. For that, we may do with stones. Virginia Boot returned with a filled shopping basket. Here, she said, red sandalwood and patchouli, vanilla beans, lavender twigs and sage and cinnamon leaves, whole nutmegs, garlic bulbs, cloves and rosemary. Everything you wanted and more. Zebediah T. Crockhustle grinned with delight. The sunbird will be so happy, he said to her with a smile. He spent the afternoon preparing a barbecue sauce. He said it was only respectful, and besides, the sunbird's flesh was often slightly on the dry side. The Epicureans spent the evening sitting at the wicker tables in the street out front, while Mustafa Stroheim and his family brought them tea and coffee and hot mint drinks. Zebediah T. Crockhustle had told the Epicureans that they would be having the sunbird of Suntown for Sunday lunch, and that they might wish to avoid food the night before, to ensure that they had an appetite. I have a presentiment of doom upon me, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy that night, in a bed that was far too small for him, before he slept, and I fear it shall come to us with barbecue sauce. They were all so hungry the following morning, Zebediah T. Crockhustle had a comedic apron on with the words, Kiss the Cook, written upon it in violently green letters. He had already sprinkled the brandy-soaked raisins and grain beneath the stunted avocado tree behind the house, and he was arranging the scented woods, the herbs, and the spices in the bed of charcoal. Mustafa Stroheim and his family had gone to visit relatives on the other side of Cairo. Does anybody have a match? Crawcustle asked. Jackie Newhouse pulled out a Zippo lighter and passed it to Crawcustle, who lit the dried cinnamon leaves and dried laurel leaves beneath the charcoal. The smoke drifted up into the noon air. 
The cinnamon and sandalwood smoke will bring the sunbird, said Crockhustle. Bring it from where? asked Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. From the sun, said Crockhustle. That's where it sleeps. Professor Mandalay coughed discreetly. He said, The earth is at its closest, 91 million miles from the sun. The fastest dive by a bird ever recorded is that of the peregrine falcon at 273 miles per hour. Flying at that speed from the sun, it would take a bird a little over 38 years to reach us. If it could fly through the dark and cold and vacuum of space, of course. Of course, agreed Zebediah T. Crockhustle. He shaded his eyes and squinted and looked upwards. Here it comes, he said. It looked almost as if the bird was flying out of the sun, but that could not have been the case. You could not look directly at the noonday sun, after all. First it was a silhouette, black against the sun and against the blue sky. Then the sunlight caught its feathers and the watchers on the ground caught their breath. You have never seen anything like the sunlight on the sunbird's feathers. Seeing something like that would take your breath away. The sunbird flapped its wings wide once. Then it began to glide in ever-decreasing circles in the air above Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house. The bird landed in the avocado tree. Its feathers were golden and purple and silver. It was smaller than a turkey, larger than a rooster, and had the long legs and high head of a heron, although its head was more like the head of an eagle. It is very beautiful, said Virginia Boot. Look at the two tall feathers on its head. Aren't they lovely? It is indeed quite lovely, said Professor Mandalay. There's something familiar about that bird's head feathers, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy. We plucked the head feathers before we roast the bird, said Zebediah T. Crawcussle. That's the way it's always done. The sunbird perched on a branch of the avocado tree in a patch of sun. It seemed almost as if it were glowing gently in the sunlight, as if its feathers had made of sunlight, iridescent with purples and greens and gold. It preened itself, extending one wing in the sunlight. It nibbled and stroked at the wing with its beak, until all the feathers were in their correct position and oiled. Then it extended the other wing and repeated the process. Finally, the bird emitted a contented chirp and flew the short distance from the branch to the ground. It strutted across the dry mud, peering from side to side, short-sightedly. Look, said Jackie Newhouse, it's found the grain. It seemed almost as if it was looking for it, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy, that it was expecting the grain to be there. That's where I always leave it, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. It's so lovely, said Virginia Boot. And now I see it closer, I can see that it's much older than I thought. Its eyes are cloudy, and its legs are shaking, but it is still lovely. The Bennu bird is the loveliest of birds, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Virginia Boot spoke good restaurant Egyptian, but beyond that she was still at sea. What's a Bennu bird? she asked. Is that Egyptian for sunbird? The Bennu bird, said Professor Mandalay, roost in the Persia tree. It has two feathers on its head. It is sometimes represented as being like a heron and sometimes like an eagle. There is more, but it is too unlikely to bear repeating. It's eating the grain and the raisins, exclaimed Jackie Newhouse. Now it's stumbling drunkenly from side to side. Ah, such majesty even in its drunkenness. Zebediah T. Crawcussel walked over to the sunbird, which, with a great effort of will, was staggering back and forth on the ground beneath the avocado tree, not tripping over its long legs. He stood directly in front of the bird, and then very slowly he bowed to it. He bent like a very old man, slowly and creakily, but still he bowed. And the sunbird bowed back to him. Then it toppled to the mud. Zebediah T. Crawcussel picked it up reverently and placed it in his arms, carrying it as one would carry a child, and he took it back to the plot of land behind Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house, and the others followed him. First he plucked the two majestic head feathers and set them aside. 
and then without plucking the bird, he gutted it and placed its guts on smoking twigs. He pulled the half-filled beer can inside the uh, body cavity and placed the bird upon the barbecue. Sunbird cooks fast, warned Croc Hustle. Get your plates ready. The beers of the ancient Egyptians were flavored with cardamom and coriander, for the Egyptians had no hops. Their beers were rich and flavorsome and thirst-quitching. You could build pyramids after drinking that beer, and sometimes people did. On the barbecue, the beer steamed the inside of the sunbird, keeping it moist. As the heat of the charcoal reached them, the feathers of the bird burned off, igniting with a flash like a magnesium flare, so bright that the Epicureans were forced to avert their eyes. The smell of the roast fowl filled the air, richer than peacock, lusher than duck. The mouth of the assembled Epicureans began to water. It seemed like it had been cooking for no time at all, but Zebediah lifted the sunbird from the charcoal bed and put it on the table. Then, with a carving knife, he sliced it up and placed the steaming meat on the plates. He poured a little barbecue sauce over each piece of meat, and he placed the carcass directly onto the flames. Each member of the Epicurean Club sat in the back of Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house, sat around an elderly wooden table, and they ate with their fingers. Zebby, this is amazing, said Virginia Boot, talking as she ate. It melts in your mouth. It tastes like heaven. It tastes like the sun, said Augustus Two Feathers McCoy, putting his food away as only a big man can. He had a leg in one hand and some breast in the other. It's the finest thing I've ever eaten, and I do not regret eating it, but I do believe I shall miss my daughter. It is perfect, said Jackie Newhouse. Tastes like love and fine music. Tastes like truth. Professor Mandalay was scribbling in the bound annals of the Epicurean Club. He was recording his reaction to the meat of the bird and recording the reactions of the other Epicureans and trying not to drip on the page while he wrote, for with one hand that he was not writing with, he was holding a wing, and fastidiously he was nibbling at the meat of it. It is strange, said Jack in Newhouse, for as I eat, it gets hotter and hotter in my mouth and in my stomach. Yep, it'll do that, and it's best to prepare for it ahead of time, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. Eat coals and flames and lightning bugs to get used to it. Otherwise, it can be a trifle hard on the system. Zebediah T. Crawcussel was eating the head of the bird, crunching its bones and beak in his mouth. As he ate, the bones sparked small lightnings against his teeth. He just grinned and chewed the more. The bones of the sunbird's carcass burned orange on the barbecue, and when they began to burn white, there was a thick heat haze in the courtyard at the back of Mustafa Stroheim's coffee house, and in it everything shimmered as if the people around the table were seeing the bird through water or a dream. It's so good, said Virginia Boot as she ate. It's the best thing I have ever eaten. It tastes like my youth. It, it tastes like forever. She licked her fingers and then picked up the last slice of meat from her plate. The sunbird of Suntown, she said. Does it have another name? It is the phoenix of Heliopolis, said Zebediah T. Crawcussel. It is the bird that dies in ashes and flame and is reborn generation after generation. It is the Bennu bird which flew across the waters when all was dark. When it's time to come, it is burned on the fire of rare woods and spices and herbs, and in the ashes it is reborn, time after time, world without end. Fire, exclaimed Professor Mandalay. It feels as if my insides are burning up. He sipped his water, but seemed no happier. My fingers, said Virginia Boot. Look at my fingers. She held them up. They were glowing inside as if lit with inner flames. Now the air was so hot you could have baked an egg in it. There was a spark and a sputter. The two yellow feathers in Augustus Two Feather McCoy's hair went up like sparklers. Crawcussel, said Jackie Newhouse of Flame, answer me truly. How long have you been eating the phoenix? A little over ten thousand years, said Zebediah. Give or take a few thousand. It's not hard once you master the trick of it. It's just mastering the trick of it that's hard. But this is the best phoenix I've ever prepared. 
or do I mean this is the best I've ever cooked, this phoenix? The years, said Virginia Boot, they are burning off you. They do that, admitted Zebediah. You've got to get used to the heat, though, before you eat it. Otherwise, you can just burn away. Why did I not remember this, said Augustus to Feathers McCoy, though the bright flames that surrounded him. Why did I not remember that this was how my father went, and his father before him, that each of them went to Heliopolis to eat the phoenix? And why do I only remember it now? Because the years are burning off of you, said Professor Mandelay. He had closed the leather book as soon as the page he had been writing on caught fire. The edges of the book were charred, but the rest of the book would be fine. When the years burn, the memories of those years come back. He looked more solid now with a wavering, burning air, and he was smiling. None of them had ever seen Professor Mandalay smile before. Shall we burn away to nothing, said Virginia, now incandescent, or shall we burn back to childhood and burn back to ghosts and angels and then come forward again? It does not matter. Oh, Krusty, this is so much fun! Perhaps, said Jackie Newhouse through the fire, there might have been a little more vinegar in the sauce. I feel a meat like this would have dealt with something more robust. And then he was gone, leaving only an afterimage. To each his own taste, said Croc Hustle, and he licked his fingers and he shook his head. Best it's ever been, he said with enormous satisfaction. Goodbye, Krusty, said Virginia. She put her flame white hand out and held his dark hand tightly for one moment, or perhaps for two. And then there was nothing in the courtyard back of Mustafa Stroheim's Kawa, or coffee house, in Heliopolis, which was once the city of the sun and is now a suburb of Cairo, but white ash which blew up in the momentary breeze and settled like powdered sugar or like snow. And nobody there but a young man with dark, dark hair and even ivory-colored teeth wearing an apron that said, Kiss the Cook. A tiny golden purple bird stirred in the thick bed of ashes on the top of the clay bricks as if it were waking for the first time. It made a high-pitched peep and it looked directly into the sun as an infant looks at a parent. It stretched its wings wide as if to dry them and eventually when it was quite ready it flew upward toward the sun and nobody watched it leave but the young man in the courtyard. There were two long golden feathers at the young man's feet, beneath the ash that had once been a wooden table, and he gathered them up and brushed the white ash from them and placed them reverently inside his jacket. Then he removed his apron, and he went on his way. Hollyberry Two Feathers McCoy is a grown woman with children of her own. There are silver hairs on her head, and there are black beneath the golden feathers in a bun at the back. You can see that once the feathers must have looked pretty special, but that would have been a long time ago. She is president of the Epicurean Club, a rich and rowdy bunch, having inherited the position many long years ago from her father. I hear that the Epicureans are beginning to grumble once again. They are saying that they have eaten everything under the sun. Thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, we'll be back two weeks uh, from today, in the first weekend or the first Thursday in February, which will be February fourth. Uh, we'll be back with more stories. I hope you will join us then. Have a wonderful day.